This is a DGSNEC lecture on vitromacular interface disorders. The content of my talk today, first we will go through normal anatomy of the vitreous, we'll talk about vitromacular adhesion, vitromacular traction, full thickness macular hole, as well as epiretinal membrane. As we all know, the vitreous comprises 80% of the volume of the eye and is consists mostly of water. Type 2 and type 9 collagen is the most common in the vitreous and contains a whole bunch of other proteins such as hyaluronin, chondroitin sulfate, fibrillins and opticin. It is important to know where the strongest points of attachment of the vitreous is. It's at the optic nerve, macula or acerata and around the blood vessels. The equatorial and the posterior vitroretinal interface consists of the posterior vitreous cortex internal limiting membrane, and the intervening extracellular matrix. In normal aging, the patient develops a posterior vitreous detachment. This starts when there is liquefaction of vitreous, creating lacunae or pockets in the vitreous. And it usually begins at about 4 years of age. The final separation of the vitreous from the optic nerve and the macula leads to posterior vitreous detachment and the PVD normally results in a clean separation between the ilar M of the retina and the cortical vitreous. In disease states, there is anomalous separation of the vitreous cortex from the internal limiting membrane, and an abnormal vitroretinal interface occurs. This happens when liquefaction occurs faster than the detachment of vitreous cortex or when abnormal adhesion of vitreous cortex to ilar M occurs. Pathology can occur when there is anomalous PVD. First, we talk about vitromacular adhesion. This is when there is incomplete separation of the posterior vitreous with persistent attachment to the macula. The IVTS group defined the OCT characteristics of VMA. It is a stage of vitreous separation when the partial detachment of the vitreous in the perifoveal area has occurred without any abnormalities to the retinal contour. Usually, these eyes appear normal on normal on sit lamp examination. VMA can be classified by the size of the adhesion. The adhesion is focal when there is less than 1,500 microns of attachment, or broad if the attachment is more than 1,500 microns. VMA is asymptomatic and non pathologic. It is considered an incomplete PVD. However, it's been hypothesized to play a role in the pathogenesis of neovascular AMD, macular hole, as well as diabetic macular edema. VMA does not need to be treated and is usually noticed on OCT examination. We can observe for resolution or for progression to vitromacular traction or even a macular hole. The next disease which we don't want to talk about is vitromacular traction. This occurs when there is excessive traction of the vitreous on the macula, causing changes to the foveal contour. On examination, the changes are subtle. There may be distortion of the fovea or a blunted foveal reflex, cystic changes in the fovea, or subretinal fluid in severe cases. You can see this OCT showing an area of attachment of the posterior vitreous cortex to the retina. It seems to be lifting the retina with a small cyst at the fovea. Patients with VMT complains of blurring of vision, wavy lines, or objects looking smaller than they are. Again, it can be classified as focal or broad-based. Broad-based areas of traction may be associated with thickening of the macula, vascular leakage on FA, macular schisis, or even cystoid macular edema. The natural history of VMT is not well established, but up to one third of eyes may spontaneously resolve. This is the grading of VMT. In picture A, we see broad VMA with adhesion. In picture B, there is focal VMT with attachment, which is less than 1,500 microns, and with distortion of the foveal surface. In picture C, there is focal VMT with foveal cystic changes. 
Most VMTs are observed if they are mild. If patients are very symptomatic and require treatment, a pasplanar vitrectomy is performed. The goal of the surgery is to eliminate anterior-posterior and tangential traction, relieving attachment of the vitreous to the macula. With regards to outcomes of surgery, the vision improvement is variable in about 44-78% to 78 of patients and is usually limited by CMO, fibrosis, chronic retinal detachment, or macular schisis. A third of eyes gain two lines of vision. The vision may not improve, but the metamorphopsia often improves. Complications of surgery, which has to be explained to the patient, includes bleeding, infection, retinal detachment, cataract, and anesthetic risk. The risk of intraoperative retinal tears is 1.6%, and post-op retinal detachment is close to 5%. In other countries, pharmacologic vitrolysis may be used. The drug used is ocriplasmin. In our centre, the cost limits its widespread use and is also not useful in severe cases. You may refer to the MIVI Trust trials for more information regarding ocriplasmin. The next very important disease that I want to talk about today is full thickness macular hole. It has an incidence of about 0.05% with female predominance, there is full thickness defect in the fovea with complete interruption of all neural retina layers from the ILM to the retinal pigment epithelium. There is anterior-posterior traction with tangential contraction of the perifoveal vitreous and this leads to the macular hole formation. The causes of macular hole are usually primary, which is idiopathic, and or it could be secondary to high myopia, trauma, macular telangiectasia, surgical trauma, or other causes of macular edema, for instance, some inflammatory processes. Clinical tests that we use to diagnose the full thickness macular hole includes the watsky allen test or the laser aiming beam test. Macular hole is classified according to the gas classification. In grade 1 is partial thickness hole. Grade 2 is full thickness hole less than 400 microns in size. Grade 3 is 400 microns or more with no complete PVD. Grade 4 is a full thickness macular hole with a complete PVD regardless of the diameter of the retinal defect. The OCT staging of macular hole is via the IVTS OCT classification. The size of the hole is used, status of the vitreous and the etiology of the hole is being described. We measure the minimum hole width, which is the narrowest point at mid-retina, as can be seen in the pictures on the left. You can see in the different stages, and from A to C, in the smaller stage, it's less than 250 microns, and a large hole will be something more than 400 microns. 50% of stage 1 holes resolves spontaneously, and 50% progress. About three-quarter of stage 2 progresses to stage 3 or 4. 3-22% 3 to of full thickness macular hole are bilateral. The prognosis of untreated full thickness macular hole is poor. 5% gets a vision of 2050 or better. About half of all eyes get 2000 or better. 40% 2200 or worse and 60% lose two or more lines after five years of follow-up. This picture shows the management and follow-up of full thickness macular hole according to the stages. In the treatment of full thickness macular hole, we perform vitrectomy with gas tamponade. We use SF6 for small and medium holes and C3F8 for large holes. This procedure may be combined with phacoemulsification and lens implant the patient has to posture for face down for two weeks and in some surgeons, they would peel the internal limiting membrane as well. Closure rate of hole is about 91-98%. to 98%. The median post-op VA is about 20-40%. Other surgical adjuncts which may be used includes transforming growth factor, recombinant TGF beta or autologous platelet. The last condition that we want to talk about is very common, aperitinal membrane. ERM is a cellular proliferation 
that creates a semi-translucent fibrocellular proliferation on the surface. The glial cells migrate through interruptions in IRM after a PVD occurs. Patient may complain of blur vision, wavy lines, small objects, or even monocular double vision. Signs of an ERM includes a reflective sheen across the retina, and this causes wrinkling of the retinal surface, which you can see on SITLAM examination. The ERM can progressively become more opaque, thereby obscuring the retinal details and may lead to intraretinal fluid accumulation. This is the epidemiology of epiretinal membrane. The common causes of epiretinal membrane includes being idiopathic, certain retinal vascular disease including diabetic retinopathy, trauma, post-retinal detachment surgery, especially after laser or cryotherapy has been performed, some inflammatory conditions, even tumours such as retinal angiomas, retinal dystrophies such as retinitis pigmentosa. Usually, when we see an ERM, we would perform an OCT to look at the structure of the ERM. And if indicated, fluorescein angiography may be used if you suspect a vascular disease. Epiretinal membrane should be observed if the vision is only mildly reduced. The vision is generally worse than 2070 in only 15% of patients, and 87% of patients remain stable over 2 to 4 years. Surgical indications, usually if the best corrected vision is less than 2060, if there's severe metamorphopsia or diplopia, you would perform a pass plana vitrectomy and membrane peel. Visualization agents may be used to stain the epiretinal membrane during the procedure. And the role of ILM peel. The recurrence is less when ILM is peeled, and ILM peel has been associated with a better final visual outcome. Vision generally improves in about 90% of eyes. Foveal thickness reduced in 88.7%, but does, usually the macula does not return to the normal contour. Predictors of surgical outcome are usually pre-op visual equity, duration of symptoms before surgery, presence or absence of cystoid macular edema, integrity of the ellipsoid zone line on the OCT, and the cone outer segment line, which is between the RPE and the ellipsoid zone. Complications of surgery include intraoperative, such as vitreous hemorrhage, retinal bleeding on the retinal surface, or iatrogenic peripheral retinal breaks. Postoperatively, recurrence occurs as about, in about 3 to 12% of times. Nucleus sclerosis cataract can occur, retinal detachment can occur, or even visual field disturbance. And of course, recurrence of the epiretinal membrane has to be explained to the patients. Thank you very much.